Hi, we are going to spend some time talking about the reactive programming, having a bit of a look at the concepts of reactive programming. And then we're also going to visit the Java EE ecosystem to see what they can offer for us to, uh, to implement reactive programming. So I have some things that I want to sort out before we start. Uh, I saw that I attracted some people here from uh, who works with Java EE today. And there is a community approach ongoing to kind of help Oracle out with getting Java EE 8 out, up and running. Uh, and if you think that that sounds interesting, you can get a lot of help from this kind of community of Java profiles. So check it out on Twitter, it's at javaee underscore guardian or javaeeguardians.io. Uh, so I want to mention a few words about me. Uh, my name is Ola Peterson. Uh, I work as a full stack web developer in uh, Sweden. I uh, have been working mostly with Java EE uh, and Angular applications, but I have also been visiting uh, things like React and Paper. So if you want to reach me during this speech or afterwards, uh, you can reach me at ola.peterson at squeed.com, that's my mail, or at Peterson on Twitter. Uh, ola is a really great name to have when you live in Sweden. <laughs> Best to be internationally, so that they think that you are a girl in Spain. Well, I've had a lot of in interesting introductions with people here when they just think that I'm running around saying hello all the time. <laughs> so I don't know, either my parents didn't want me to succeed internationally or they really wanted me to succeed in Barcelona or in Spain because I keep hearing my name all over the place. Uh, I'm gonna mention my company real fast. I understand that you're not interested in a Swedish company. But I just want to mention that we are the Jago organizers in Gothenburg. So if you ever trespass and uh, pass Sweden, and you, if you want to join us for some, some Java talks, or if you have something you want to talk about, uh, hit us up with a mail or, or, um, or a tweet or something, and we'll see if we can do something fun together. Okay, so you can't spell show without show. So, this is not only going to be a talk here with slides, I built something here today. Uh, what it does is that it goes out to Twitter and it takes all the tweets under the hashtag JBCN16. Uh, so this will be live and this will be kind of the demo application that we will look, uh, look a bit at. So if you want to join me on stage, tweet under JBCN16. Or as Queen would have put it, the show must go wrong. That's why you live code and use Twitter API live on stage. So, let's have a look at a pattern that I see quite often in, in my code. So, we get a request in. The first thing we do is to just dispatch this further down into the code to some kind of time consuming thing. And whenever that time consuming thing quits, we'll get a response back. And we just dispatch that back to the client. And I think you've seen this pattern as well. Because what we usually do during this time is that we show a spinner to, to our end users. Uh, so if this would be an HTTP request, we would hog an HTTP thread. And we would cram onto that HTTP thread, even though that we're probably doing some computing in parts where, where we don't really need the HTTP thread. So why are we doing it like this? Why aren't we doing it a bit more like this, where we get the request and we, of course, have to handle that request. So we'll hold the thread for, for a short time and then we're going to release it and we're not blocking it. And eventually we get a call back from this time-consuming thing and, and then we return. And during this time we can continue to do something else in our main thread since we are not blocking So the reason why I'm telling you this is that this is, of course, uh, non-blocking programming or, or asynchronous programming. And it's one of the core fundamentals that you see in reactive programming. So, half a year ago, I would have said that reactive programming, when I started to hear about it, it's kind of buzzwordy, people are just throwing it out there. Uh, but a company named Lightband, uh, it's the company that stands behind Akka, uh, Play, etc. They try to make a concrete manifesto out of, uh, of a reactive programming. Um, and this is what they suggest that a reactive programming is or how a system or that's reactive should be built. 
So the main goal for us is to be responsive. We want to have short feedback times and response times to our client. We want them to always feel like they are up to date with what's happening uh, so that they aren't kind of waiting for these 10 second spinners. A reactive system should also be elastic. So they aren't saying scalable here, they are saying elastic because an elastic system can, can grow when you are under really high pressure, but it can also shrink and don't use that many resources when you are not under high pressure. Um, a uh, responsive or a reactive system should also be resilient. Uh, Jonas Bonier has a talk where he says that it's quite funny that we call it exceptions in Java because they are happening quite often, so maybe they aren't exceptions. <laughs> um, they should handle that more of, as a first order citizen. So you should expect your system to fail once in a while and be ready to handle it. And all of this should be built on a message driven architecture. So, uh, we can send messages and react to events rather than having this kind of uh, hard coupling where we call, have callbacks through threads down the stack. Okay, so this is probably the most boring, uh, boring slide I have. Um, do you know about Reddit? Is Reddit big in Spain? It's like a website that lets other users browse the web for you, so you will get all the good content. They have the concepts of too long did a tweet when somebody blabs on too much and you you just lose loses focus. The too long didn't read of a responsive uh, system, uh, re reactive system is that you shouldn't block, you should always aim to be responsive to your, to your end users. Uh, or a screen would have put it, don't stop me now, and that should you always be in the back of your head. Okay, so that's a bit of what reactive programming is, um, but why? Why should we care about reactive programming? Well, first and foremost, the most important thing is that five years ago, it was completely fine to, to show a spinner for five seconds as long as you provided a really much data to the user. Uh, even ten years ago, I, I could go and grab a, and cook a cup of coffee uh, whilst loading my new site. And I was happy if it was half rendered when I got back. But today's users are used to things like Facebook, like Netflix, where everything just happens instantly. So the end users requirements on our application are getting to or starting to get really really high, even if you are on Facebook. But they are starting to get used to that kind of feedback. So that's the most important part, the end users. But also the hardware has gone through uh, quite amazing evolution in the last five years. Um, my my mobile phone today has more cores and more threads than my first computer had. So we kind of have the hardware resources there, and we also have the IT infrastructure, so we have good connections on our servers uh, with a lot of broadband. So we have all the resources there, we just have to start to use them a bit more. So the interesting part is of course how. And this is how in the context of Java EE. So in Java EE we have the WebSocket uh, specification where we have async remote endpoints. We will have a look at them very soon. Uh, we also have the AGB3 API with message driven beans and asynchronous session beans, which we will also have a look at today. We will continue with CDI with events and observes, uh, and JMS will be kind of included. Uh, since JMS is the queuing system, it's very asynchronous by default uh, and has a lot of these traits that a reactive uh, application wants. So there are a bit more uh, things in Java EE. Uh, we have a server with asynchronous server and <coughs> unlocking I/O. We have JaxRS with async on both server and client, and uh, computer's utils. I won't show you these today, mainly because we're gonna focus a bit more on the sockets. So they say responsive in the reactive manifesto, and I say WebSocket. So what a WebSocket is, is basically an ordinary HTTP request down to your server, but it also requests an upgrade. So you will do a kind of a handshake and then eventually you will get an upgrade, which in the end results that you have a WebSocket connection and a socket connection between <coughs> your server and your client. And this of course allows for full duplex communication between your client and your server. 
the latency in our WebSocket connection is very, very low, and you kind of skip all the overhead of always sending headers and cookies, etc. You will have a maintained, established connection to, to the server and device. So let's have a look at how we do a WebSocket in Java EE. Let me just read. <coughs> So the first thing you want to have in a WebSocket is, of course, an endpoint. You have to be able to connect somewhere. <clears throat> so we'll annotate our class with at server endpoint uh, from the Java's WebSocket server package. Uh, we'll call it hello WebSocket. And what we have in the specification of the WebSocket is that we have an onopen method. That's where we end up when we establish our connection. We have on message where we will end up whenever we start to send messages with our server. And then we have the on close and, and on error. So whenever somebody is closing the connection or if something uh, happens. So the on open method, what it does is that it's an annotation at on open uh, and it takes a Javax WebSocket session. So for now, let's just take that session, the session that opened the connection. And we can get an asynchronous remote back, a handler back to that client, which allows us to send text back to them. So this is the form of duplex communication. <coughs> so let's write server, you are connected. So that's nice, we can open a connection to our web, web socket, but of course we also want to handle messages, and you do that with the at on message uh, annotation. What you now send in or what you get is again a session. The session that sent you the, the session that sent you the message and you also get the, the message. So for now let's do the same thing. We get the handler back to the client and then we'll send boom for now. <coughs> so hopefully we will see that this works in our client. But of course, there has to be a connection that actually opens this. And I have prepared this in, in the JavaScript of my site. Um, I don't want to focus too much on the JavaScript during this Java session. But what has been happening is that we have created a new WebSocket with the URL to my, my endpoint. So in this case, it would be WS and then localhost slash hello WebSocket, which was the annotation we put. Then we kind of bind uh, the same things that we did in the Java back and also in the JavaScript. So we have callback functions on, uh, on the WebSocket object in JavaScript. Uh, so we'll send an open connection message when we are connecting, and then we'll, whenever we get a message in the front end, we will just log it out into the console for now. <coughs> so if we go to our site, you'll see that we are calling OpenSocket. This is from the, the JavaScript and the server sent back that you are connected. So everything seems to work. If we do a WebSocket send here, ping, we'll get a pong back. Amazing. <laughs> Okay, this is pretty crappy, right? We haven't even a request response pattern. We have a send and a pong pattern here. But let's see what we can do to make the WebSocket a bit more interesting. So let's put a set of sessions in our, in our WebSocket. Uh, we'll call that Pierce. somebody now is connecting to us, what we do is that we'll take the peers and we'll add that session to, to our set, our state, etc. Uh, whenever we get a message, what we'll do is that we'll loop through all the peers and for each peer, we want to make sure that uh, the peer, sorry, here is not equal to the session that sent the message, uh, and if so, we'll take the peers asynchronous remote and we'll send the text, uh, the message that we got. 
Okay. So recap. We have a set of all the sessions connected to our to our WebSocket. We'll add that uh, session to to whenever we get connected. We are adding them to uh, to our peers. Whenever we get a message, we will look through all the peers, check that we were the session that sent the message, and in that case, send the message out. So this usually works out better if you have a bit better resolution, but we will see if we can make this work. Or we get a 404. <laughs> ah, okay. So this is now my, my Chrome tab. What I've done is that I also have a Vivaldi browser down here. So let's both connect to the server. Uh, so this is the console of the Vivaldi browser. This is the console of Chrome. And what we now can do is to send... Hi, how are you? And as you see here, we now get the message to this, this client. So, WebSocket Sam, well, you know I'm not a beta. Okay. Ah. That's a bit weird. Yeah, I probably messed it up. But you saw the first case, right? That I was able to send the messages to. Uh, let's do one more try. Yeah, okay. So basically, what we just built in, in just a few minutes was a chat application, right? It's not the best chat application. <laughs> I doubt that you will have, uh, have uh, any means to sell this chat application. Uh, if you want to, just make sure that you give some profit to me as well. Uh, if you can convince your users to sit in the console and write to each other. But it's quite a few means to, to, get a, to get a full duplex communication where you can not only talk with the server, the server can talk with you, and you can also talk with other connected clients, and it's quite fast. So of course, when it comes to the reactive manifesto, the things that we do get here is the responsiveness. We are able to, as soon as we have data that's interesting to other clients, sending it out to them. Uh, WebSocket was introduced in Java EE7. So it's new, it's almost two and a half years old. Um, but uh, if you are running Java E7, the WebSocket API will be available for you. Uh, when it comes to compatibility, uh, for some reason this browser called IE has a few red boxes here. But if you are running IE 10 and forward, and if you are running supporting Opera Mini, then you will be able to use WebSocket in browsers. Then of course, if you are writing uh, uh, microservices or something like that, you can uh, you can also use WebSockets, but then you have to have a WebSocket uh, library instead. Okay, so the reactive manifesto also says that we should be message driven and that we should send events and react to events. Then I say a message driven. <laughs> <laughs> So what a message driven bean is, uh, it's an uh, EGB, uh, an enterprise job bean. Uh, but what you do is that you put a listener on it, so you connect it to a queue. And whenever messages are put on this queue, you will react on that. So you will trigger your, your MDB, um, yeah, and then you can do whatever. So what I have done here is that I have prepared this a bit, uh, so I created a REST endpoint which will put uh, messages on a queue. <coughs> but uh, what, I would look, uh, what I would show you is the MDB. So we will have a look at the MDB, which now listens to this queue. Uh, whenever that gets triggered, we inject the WebSocket in our MDB. And you know, now we have full duplex uh, communication out to the client. So we can now immediately push that content out to, to the client. So let's have a look on what you need to have an MDB. Disable my rest. My web socket. So, what you start with in an MDB is that you'll have to have the at message driven annotation on your on your code. Uh, we'll also have an activation config property. So the property name here, destination, this is actually mandatory. And the property value is the queue that you want to listen on, the queue that you want to get triggered on. 
So we are also going to implement the message listener to get a bit of the nice features from, from the JMS API. What this does is that whenever we actually get the message on the queue, we will end up in the <coughs> message, um, message function here. So what we have done, or what I've done also, is that I have injected a WebSocket. So a message is put on the queue, we try to parse that up as a text message, and then in the end we push that message out, out to uh, our clients. So let's see if we can get this to work as well. No. So for some reason my wife has become quite slow lately. Okay, this is all part of that, the show must go wrong, that's why you like it. <laughs> so let's see, do we have this? We are in it, we have socket. Don't have this started. So you are now my, my peer reviewers, but I didn't show you that much code, so it might be a bit more. now when we connect uh, is that we will say welcome uh, we will provide you with data as soon as we have it available because at this point we don't have any messages that has been sent to our MDB. What I will do in my terminal here is that I will uh, call that REST service that I showed you before that will put the message on, on the queue and then we'll push it out hopefully to the client. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So this is from the MDB, uh, and we, we get a dummy message here. And this could be quite handy when you, when you integrate with legacy systems or whatever external system. If you have some kind of weather service, you maybe want to send out warnings in real time to, to your connected clients. So one of the main benefits that I've seen in my actual project is, of course, the, that queues has been used a lot before. And this is something that you can use with things like Cupid, uh, we've done it with Cupid, ActiveMQ, or basically any broker that you, that you have running. So, of course, that's a main benefit that we can now react even though it's an external system that, that does this on for us. But the MDBs will also run asynchronously, so we can scale this really well, even if we get a lot of messages. And of course, with kind of also load balance uh, the messages on the queue so we can we can start to uh, uh, scale it on our hardware as well. Uh, one of the really good benefits with having this kind of message driven parts is of course also isolation. So we don't really care about the producer here. We are the consumer, but the implementation of the producer is not relevant to us. Uh, so we kind of have a really loosely coupled uh, system here as well. Um, so, while I'm doing this in, in an asynchronous way, and when we are listening to events in an asynchronous way, we kind of get a lot of high throughput for, for all our messages, instead of having some kind of embedded system. So this is really good. Uh, there are a lot of configurations for the MDBs. I won't go through them all, uh, but I just wanted to tell you that there are a lot of configurations, like message selectors and uh, the 
destination type, etc. Uh, this is on the Java EE uh, tutorial, so have a look there if you're interested. So now we get the benefit of like loosely coupling things uh, with messages and with events, and we can run it asynchronously. We can get higher throughput uh, with when external systems are putting something on the queues. So why wouldn't we do this inside our application as well? And now we're going to have a look at CDI and event and observes. So this was introduced in Java 6, right, with the CDI. And what event and observes is, is that it uses CDI to create kind of a published subscribe pattern for typed objects. That's basically how it works. So if we have an event here and we make it fire an event, we will, uh, we can then fire it of the type my class. Then we can connect one or multiple observers here. So in this picture, it's one that observes the type uh, my class. So what I built is that I will fire an event here uh, that will actually get the tweets under JBCM 16. Uh, and then whenever I get tweets, uh, I'll, I'll fire the event, and the observer will pick this up. There you know the story, I have injected my web socket and I can immediately push this information out to the client as soon as I have it available. <coughs> so how it looks in code is that I'll have a dummy scheduler. <coughs> so I have just a dummy scheduler here that once every 10 seconds, this is not really that reactive, but uh, I had to add a system that provided me with a lot of data. Uh, once every 10 seconds, it goes out and it gets a list of status uh, or tweets, basically, under the hashtag JBCN16. What we have previously done here is that we have injected a, a Java event, a Java Enterprise event, of the type list status. So this status is what we do for J, the type of that object that they provide me with when I get the tweets. And whenever we have this, we'll tell the rest of the system that, okay, uh, the, the list status event happened. So we'll fire that. At the same time, I'll have a, a listener. So what the listener, uh, what you have to do here is that you'll add the app observes in the method head. Again, of list status, the same type as the fired event. And now this method will get triggered as soon as that event is fired. And then you know the drill. We'll take the, the we'll take the websocket and push it out to the client. So this is the scariest part. I will try to show you this with hashtag JBCN live demo. <coughs> So the first thing that happens was that it said that we didn't have any data. Eventually we got the tweets. And now hopefully it will be fast with your API because this is not really reliable. I'll give it 10 more seconds. Aha, there we have it. So this is kind of kind of good as well, right? As an end user, we, we just sat here and waited, and whenever something happened in the system that we were interested in as an end user, we got it immediately. So we were really, uh, really responsive. And of course, and hey, thank you, Tim Gates. Ah, slide from his cradle show. Well, uh, never mind. Uh, yeah, so the idea I had when I put together, uh, when I started to research the events and observes, was of course that I don't want to block. I want to be in my main thread, and then I want to tell the rest of the system that right now uh, I did this, I aggregated this data or whatever. So I, I just wanted to fire the event to tell the rest of the systems if they were interested that it happened, and then continue on my main thread. But uh, what I found out was that the, the CDI and events and observes is actually firing synchronously. So the way you solve this in Java EE is with the at asynchronous, uh, at asynchronous tag. So if you do this on the class level, uh, all of the methods in your class will be fired uh, asynchronously. If you do it on method level, uh, that method will be fired uh, asynchronously. 
And the thing that you're obliged to when you use the app asynchronous is to either return void or you'll return uh, return a future. So we're gonna leave Java EE8. Oh, by the way, I, I had already done that, but it's just an app asynchronous tag in the code. So this is all you need to run it asynchronous. So we're going to leave Java EE Java e for system and look a bit at Java SE8. So be smart, be like Bart, don't fight the future. So completable futures were introduced in the big Lambda update of Java. Um, if you haven't worked with futures before, what future is is basically that you say, go and do this for me. I don't care for it right now, but I want to know it in the future and then I will ask you to get this for me. So completable futures, uh, they are kind of an extension that also implements completion stage uh, on futures. Uh, so they give us a lot of nice features with, uh, with the Lambda API. And they have a lot of uh, methods for running things asynchronously and also doing kind of all chains asynchronously. So the way you create a completable future is... So you'll have a completable future, you'll make it a type string, uh, test, and what you want to do is to take the completable future and supply something asynchronously. So this will, this will do whatever I write here uh, to be running another thread here. Um, if you're up to date what the supply async wants you have as a supplier, if you're up to date with your Java 8 syntax, you can actually give a supplier as just an empty method head, and then you can return whatever. Um, ah, it's Swedish, okay. Hey, that's how it is. Voila. So what would happen is that when we instantiate this here, we would go out and start to compute this in, in a separate thread. Um, we could continue here to do whatever we want. Okay, this is just returning a string, but this is a silly example. So imagine that this actually was some time consuming. But we could continue here to, to uh, work on the main thread. So don't, don't mind me, uh, just continuing on the main thread. And then eventually, of course, we want the result of this completable future. And what we do then is that we'll take test.get. And this is a blocking operation. So this says that now I will block on the thread until you actually return, return the value that you computed for me. But as I said, the completable future API holds a lot of nice features for kind of writing asynchronous programming. And if you want a responsive system, you don't really want to block here. So you could put a threshold on how long it should be running. But you could also say get now. Get now takes a default string. So uh, in this case, since my, my uh, completable future returns to it. But that will return a default value for us if the completable future didn't finish. Uh, what else we can do is that when the first feature finish, we can then say, then apply. So we then want to do some kind of computation with that response. We can say, then apply async. So then we do apply, but we are applying async. Uh, so this is the common case that whatever method you find in the completable future, it most often also supports it asynchronously. So it's a really nice API. Uh, I I think you should absolutely check it out. Uh, I'm going to show you a really small silly test here. So, <coughs> whoa. so what I've done is that I have uh, two futures. The first future uh, calls a dummy thread sleeper. The dummy thread sleeper sleeps the thread for four seconds. Then we have the second uh, future uh, that does the exact same thing. Uh, and then we are uh, just returning a string in the dummy thread sleeper. So here we are going to try the WebSocket again. So we have uh, injected a WebSocket. We are just saying that we want these two values uh, and then we are returning them. At the same time as I start this function, I'm also starting uh, a function in kind of the old way or the synchronous way. So uh, we'll call the dummy thread sleeper for the first and then the second. So let's see if we can get this. <coughs> I 
really don't know why my wild play has become so slowly. So this is this is a really silly example. I just want to show you that it actually works. I will call this uh, API endpoint. What it will do is that it will start first the synchronous way of doing it, and in parallel the, the completable future test with the two futures. And hopefully, as we expect, the async finishes in about half the time as the synchronous way uh, finishes. So just a silly example to show you that, that it actually works. Okay, so the completable future is a really good API to kind of write a synchronous way when you look at it from the kind of a synchronous write, but you are executing it asynchronous. Okay, so what Queen would have said at this point was, was that I want it all. So if you go to work on Monday and you'll start to annotate that asynchronous everywhere, You'll put MDBs on every external system, you'll use the CDI everywhere. What happens is that now you will have thre threads running in parallel everywhere. That means that it will explode <laughs> everywhere. Uh, or as Queen would have put it, we are uh, under pressure. Uh, so, of course, there isn't a silver bullet in this world, and the drawback of asynchronous programming, or one of the drawbacks, is that it's quite hard to debug, it gets quite complex quite fast. So if you do these kind of things, also have a look at your design. Uh, I haven't talked that much about resilience today, mainly because I don't think it's really a Java AE thing, it's more of how you design your systems. Uh, but if you look, go to the microservices talks, I'm sure they're going to mention things like bulkheads or circuit breakers, etc. And of course you can take these patterns and also implement them internal on your server, and I think you should. Uh, we also be sure to kind of test everything with Gatling or whatever, to really see how your, your system behaves, uh, behaves under pressure. Okay, uh, I'm very soon going to be finishing this. I want to say that you can become reactive today. Uh, a lot of people read the reactive manifesto and then it's religion. Like either you do it all or you don't do anything. And I don't agree with that at all. So the main point here is that we want the end users or whatever, our, our consumers to get a more responsive feel for our application. And you can do that by taking some parts of this. If you have an existing legacy system, for instance, you might have some really good candidates that should be running synchronously, but don't do it all over your code. Um, also, a lot of web frameworks has really good support for REST. Then you can use the web socket for kind of doing a push out to the client for it to get through REST. And you're instantly being a bit more responsive, but you can still reuse all of your old code. Okay, that's it. Uh, I know that the JVC and group are going to collect the feedback on this session. This is uh, more for my own sake. So if you want to, and if you have time to, this is a really, really short survey. Uh, at least give me a number from, from 1 to 6. Uh, I would appreciate it a lot for me to, to improve in presentations. If you want to look at the slides again, you can find them at wirdr.se um, slash olb. So I'll leave it up. Good. Uh, if you are interested in the references, they will be on that uh, slideshow. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Transactions. So if you use it in in the you still have transactions right? But most likely, if you have a really hard case where transactions are the most important thing, I, I would not use it actually. And injection. The injection of. The, I mean, if if they just in some injected thing, and some status, then it's not. Oh yeah, yeah. Then you have to in, in inject the result here. Yeah.
I'll try the which work. Because you, you, have, you will be using the same statements for all for several threads. Is it okay? Uh, if you do the events and observes, then you will have a thread state context in, in the kind of basic concept that is present to run. Do you have any other questions? Oh yeah, sorry, I'll bring them up. Uh, these are the, the slides. Or hit me up on, on Twitter. It's at OLP, Peter Sun, it's a bit more international. Okay, it doesn't seem to be that many questions, so again, thank you all for attending and uh,